So we're going to talk a little bit about the terrain, how to find coos deer, and also the gear. So it's going to be kind of a dual thing. A lot of these questions I get asked, and I am, love helping people kind of get their foot in the door and do their first DIY coos hunt, or just kind of understand coos hunting before they go out. Okay, so the first thing is, is let's talk about the terrain, where to find coos deer, what are their habitats, what are their ranges, and just give a basic overview. So, um, in Arizona, there are kind of three levels of terrain and three main areas that you will find coos deer. Coos deer are indigenous to the southern Arizona area and northern Mexico, uh, northern Sonora specifically. So in the, within that, typically you'll find coos deer along the border of Arizona, all throughout the border and in northern Mexico. And in that area, usually it's higher elevation desert country. So higher elevation being 3,000 feet or higher and it doesn't necessarily need to be extreme mountain ranges. So one misconception about coos deer is that they're all found in the tops of mountains. That is not true. Big populations of coos deer found in rolling hills in the right environment. So rolling hills at higher desert elevations will often hold big populations of coos deer. You don't have to hike mountains. You can uh, walk on foot. You can take your side by side. You can take your truck and hunt these areas. Pretty much all of the borderland like that is consistent with uh, coos deer find, found all throughout that area. The second tier is kind of that sky island. So in Arizona we have what is called sky islands. Now what a sky island is, and I'm not going off exact dictionary definition is, but it, for Arizona residents, basically you have these mountain ranges that uh, appear to come out of nowhere, almost like an island would in the middle of the ocean. So they they come, they come, start at the desert floor, 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet, and they can go all the way up to 85, 9,000 feet in elevation. Very short time, uh, very, very short distance, and just be a, a, what's seemingly a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Coos deer really, really gravitate toward these sky islands. Typically what you'll find in these areas... Um, and I'll list them too so you understand. The Huachuca Mountains is considered Sky Islands. The Chiricahua Mountains are considered Sky Islands. The Rincons, um, the Catalinas. Um, there's some other mountain ranges that are a little bit in between um, that are considered kind of that Sky Island. Uh, the Santa Ritas as well are considered kind of that Sky Island environment where you have literally desert floor all the way up to mountains where you have pine trees and you can look down you can see cactus. So, um, Within that environment usually means that there's water up in these mountains, so usually there's uh, a good good access to water. There is oaks, junipers, and pine trees. Now oaks give a lot of cover and also a lot of uh, food, acorns and, and just scrub brush and stuff that, that Kuzi really like to eat. Um, and then uh, junipers are kind of in that transitional period where they kind of grow. Some people call them alligator junipers. Some people call them pinions. Um, they, they, they're, I don't know what the exact species is. They can be a little different depending on the region, but we just call them junipers in general. So, um, the sky islands are those areas where it's extreme elevation and you have uh, a lot of hiking, deep canyons. These coos deer live very, very, uh, tight to where they water, feed, and bed. It, Typically, a coos deer range is not too much more than a mile or two their whole life. So they will wander out uh, past a mile during the rut when they need to go look for a, a partner to go breed with. But typically, a coos deer will be found in the same area within a square mile. And when you climb and hike and hunt into this country where it's high elevation, deep cans, you understand that it doesn't make sense for a coos deer to have a 35-mile range in these mountains. It makes sense for them they can live in these areas that have everything in one spot. So they naturally live in an area that have food, water, and shelter very close by, where they don't have to go wander, um, you know, three or four miles to go get water, and then go back and feed in the open meadows, and then come back in the timber. It's not that situation. So that is your typical uh, coos deer country, uh, longer shots, longer hikes, steep elevation. So that's your first two. The third type of terrain is 
what is considered in Arizona kind of the rim country. We call it rim country or um, specifically known as the Mogollon Rim, which is north of Phoenix. Not all coups here are located on the border next to Mexico. There are coups here that are located far north of Phoenix. So when you get north of Phoenix, there is a geographical landmark called the Mogollon Rim, and it's basically just what it sounds like. It's a big rim, high elevation, 5,000 to seven, 8,000 feet at the end of it, um, and it just creates kind of that Sky Island atmosphere, but being well into pines, juniper country. There's no more uh, saguaro cactuses, not very many prickly pears. It's a lot colder. The elevations don't drop below 5,000 feet typically. And so you have these coos here that are living almost isolated up in some of this rim country where they live in very, very specific spots. Populations are a little bit more um, concentrated in certain areas. They don't just live all throughout that rim country. But in as far as game management units are concerned, what you're looking at is like 21, 22, 6A, 23, 27. All that stuff, basically all the units that go north of Phoenix, though that's Mogollon Rim, 6A and 22 are kind of that boundary. Um, well, there's that's kind of some of the west northwestern boundary of the Mogollon Rim, and then you have like uh, uh, 22 is the boundary. Unit 22 and 23, their northernmost boundary is basically the Mogollon Rim. So within that country, what's unique about that is is it's mainly just coos deer and elk that live there. There aren't a ton of mule deer. There's a few. Where in contrast. In Sky Island country, it's primarily just coos deer living up in the mountains, and some cats and some turkeys. Um, and then in the desert floor, you have coos deer, mule deer, um, and cats. Obviously, cats kind of live everywhere. But you have the different environments where coos deer share spots with big giant bull elk in one spot where mule deer don't really like to live. And then another area where coos deer pretty much just maintain their own little habitats and populations in Sky Island country. Um, and then you have the desert floor where they kind of mix and match and there's a lot of transition areas where coos deer will be hanging around mule deer. Not hanging with them necessarily, but being in the same areas and not necessarily segregated. So some of that desert floor is strictly mule deer country too. So when I talk about the desert floor or kind of the borderlands, we're not talking about the extreme flats that you find like out of Phoenix or around Casa Grande or um, north of Tucson. A lot of that country where it's just mesquite flats, a lot of that country is not what I'm talking about, Coosier. We're talking about higher elevation rolling hill desert country like 3,000 feet. So if you see uh, giant flats with saguaros and mesquites, you're probably not going to find a huge population of Coosier. They will be in that area, but what you're looking for is that transition country where it comes from higher elevation mountains into rolling hills, still desert. You'll find lots of bear grass and mesquites and ocotillo and uh, prickly pear cactus. Uh, some uh, There's a lot of different kinds of cactus, but choya cactus and some saguaros as well. So you have kind of that transition zone there. Um, and so that's the three basic environments of you go from lower elevation rolling hills out of the mountains. That's kind of where Coos Your Country starts. High into the mountains, and kind of talking about Arizona specifically, high into the mountains where they kind of strictly inhabit. And then you go even further north, north of Phoenix, where um, it is high elevation, rugged country, steep canyons, rim country, and it's just pockets of coos deer uh, living with elk. And it's it, it's some of the biggest coos deer ever taken in the state of Arizona. I've actually taken have been taken from that rim country. But I will tell you, it is extremely hard to hunt uh, from a physical standpoint, from a glassing standpoint. It's very very thick country, lots of oak, lots of pine trees, lots of juniper. So it's not an area that is uh, a very friendly area to hunt coos deer uh, in comparison to some of that lower desert country. A little bit friendlier to hike, drive and walk around. Also, so within all of that terrain, these coos are very adaptable. There is kind of a caveat in there. They they do adapt and anytime you see like a riverbed or a river, uh, which are not common in Arizona, you typically will find uh, populations of coos as well. So just kind of like eastern whitetail do in, in states like Wyoming and Montana where it's 
predominantly mule deer country, the whitetail live actually in the lowlands and the river bottom. So that's where you find eastern whitetail in areas like Montana, Wyoming, where it's kind of really big mountains, but you still have these river breaks and the whitetail inhabit those areas. Well, unlike those areas, the whitetail inhabit the mountains in Arizona, but they also like the river bottom areas. That's kind of the first wave, guys, just so you understand the different types of terrain in coos deer country, whether that being in Mexico or Arizona. I'm specifically talking about Arizona because it is a fantastic place to hunt coos deer. It has the biggest population of coos deer, almost the only population of coos deer um, in the United States. There is a few that live on the New Mexico Arizona border, but those are all Arizona coos deer. They just kind of wander across for a little bit. There really are coos deer, um, but New Mexico does have some tags out for them, and there are some bucks out there that live there, but not big populations. Um, so yeah, that's basically the start of it. So understanding what the terrain is can often give you a good idea of what to expect to go hunt. So if you're DIY hunting and you're like, hey, I read something online that, you know, unit 22 has good draw odds and there's really good coos deer and I've seen some pictures, you need to understand that 22, just as an example, is up in the rim country and what that means is very thick, roads are brutal, high elevation, hard to glass, can be some awesome coos deer hunting, but it's not a good hunt in my opinion where you just go cut your teeth on where you're like hey I want to go coos deer hunting I'm going to go chase around deer and you know 7,000 feet where it's very very sparse po population in some areas um, you can hunt in that southern 22 and some of that rim country those units go all the way down to Phoenix close to it and there are a lot of coos deer down that southern desert stuff but it's not the best area to just kind of go and, and hope to find some deer. To start out coos hunting, and if it's your first DIY hunt, what you really want to do is determine what style of hunt you want to do, what you're physically capable of, because the rim country might be right up your alley. It's hiking, backpacking, um, to me, to have the best coos deer hunt, backpacking, hiking, uh, wilderness areas, uh, some of that really remote stuff, but you got to be able to physically handle that. You got to be ready to potentially bring a buddy with you for safety and also just understand the water scenario too, because there's not water everywhere in Arizona, just like there is in Colorado or Wyoming or Montana. So um, maybe the best situation for somebody who's new to coos hunting, maybe more towards the border, along some of those border units where it's easier to access uh, it doesn't require you to backpack hunt. Um, there's strong populations of coos deer, and it's a good maybe get your feet in the door, understand what it's all about. You're going to see a few hunters, guys. In all of these units, we're talking about public land. There's very little pub, very little private land anywhere in Arizona. So we're talking about public land. There are hardly any areas in Arizona where you will go and not run into somebody, even in the most remote backpacking type places, guys. So just expect that. You're not going to see orange hats everywhere like you are, like you do in Wyoming, um, but you will run into some people. So it's it's a matter of, yeah, if you're hunting off roads in some of that borderland, you're going to see more people than you are going hiking, deep backpacking in some of the Sky Island stuff around Tucson or around Sierra Vista or around Safford. You're, you're going to see uh, a lot more people kind of road hunting in some of those road-friendly coos hunting areas. But in that same regard, you're, you may not see more people up where you're backpacking in, but it's a lot harder. Uh, logistics become a little bit more extreme, and you may strike out a little bit more just trying to find out where these coos are living because they don't live in every uh every mountain crevice they, they do like certain areas so and I'm just specifically talking about guys who have never done it just getting into coos deer hunting for the first time so um, that being said I hope that offers a little bit of understanding about coos deer terrain habitat and and where they live and how to hunt them so the next step is is the gear so if you have an idea of what you want to hunt or what you can get drawn for or um, kind of understand, hey, I want to go backpacking or I want to do a little bit of road hunting and backpacking or kind of some of that kind of stuff. You understand what you need to do. Let's talk gear. And gear is more directed at how we hunt coos deer. 
So there are three pieces of equipment that are invaluable when you are hunting coos deer. The first being a tripod. You cannot do anything without a tripod uh, in hunting in Arizona. I would say in general, whether it's mule deer, elk, or coos deer. But your tripod is a big investment and it's something that will not only ensure the best glassing opportunities but also shot opportunities because you use them with your rifle as well. It's a huge, huge tool that offers so many different variables to use and, and help assist in being a successful hunt. So tripod is number one. And I'm going to include some pictures and, and some links in the description below guys. I am completely unsponsored. I don't want a cut of anything you click on. I am just doing this because I'm passionate about coos hunting and I want guys to be successful. I'm not trying to sell anything specifically, just giving you an example, maybe some price ranges that you're looking at um, because we all go through that. So in this gear talk, it is more of a what you can afford type situation because you may not be able to just throw in a, uh, get a $500 tripod, a $3,000 pair of binoculars and a $5,000 rifle to start coos hunting. So we're gonna go through that. Tripod's number one. And with that tripod, now you've got to put a pair of binos on that tripod. A pair of binos is very important. Um, I would say if you are starting out coos deer hunting and you haven't done a lot of spotting, stalking, even if you have, say in Wyoming or whatever, I would invest in a pair of 15 power binos. I specifically, my setup is not 15 powers, but I'm giving you that advice because that is the best way to jumpstart you into uh, understanding tripod, glassing of a tripod and glassing for coos deer. My setup is a very expensive setup and maybe not be the best one for somebody starting out. It is, I run a pair of 10 powers with a range finder and I, I run a Swarovski BTX, which is a dual eyepiece, basically a giant binocular. Um, and that is something that may be out of everyone's price range. And again, not something that I would ever suggest by somebody just starting out in the coos deer hunting realm. Um, so anyway, 15 power binos kind of bridges the gap between a pair of 10s, which you're pretty undergun when you're glassing up big mountains at a mile or two away, and a spotting scope. So I'm not going to say you don't need a spotting scope, but it's not mandatory to have a spotting scope if you're coos here hunting. That's why 15s can kind of bridge both those gaps because with a pair of 15s, you can you can estimate and properly judge a coos here if you've got the right light and the distance is reasonable, if it's a buck and if it's a good buck and if it's kind of got a frame or whatever. So if you're just starting out, you're probably not going to be looking for a 110 inch coos deer on your first hunt. You want to get a respectable buck, glass up bucks, glass up deer, and with 15 powers that, that gives you the opportunity to do both of those things and be successful and also not break the bank. So you're not carrying all this gear, you're not buying all this gear. So what you basically need is a tripod, a pair of 15s, um, usually a stool or something to go along with that. There's a couple good stools out there that I'll, I'll include in the link in the description or a butt pad, something to protect your pants and just kind of keep you comfortable for sitting for sometimes hours at a time on these hills. So first thing, tripod, second thing, binos. Guys, you can totally do a, a big time setup. You can do a Swarovski BTX. You can do, um, you know, doctors or Koa Highlanders or have 10s, 15s, and a spotting scope. There are guys that do that. Some of my buddies run a pair of 10s on their chest, and then they run a pair of 15s when they're sitting down glassing off a tripod, and then they have a spotting scope so when they actually see a buck or, or need to identify or properly trophy judge a deer at a longer distance or get some video, they have a, tr a, a spotting scope for that. So you can do that, but it's not mandatory. Spotting scopes are great for getting video, for getting a, a, a good, accurate estimate of what the deer is, maybe sexing the deer from a long ways away, or uh, just understanding how big the buck is specifically. So there are some really good uh, spotting scopes out there too, so I want to touch on that. Um, I My personal opinion is that Vortex is really tough to beat in any uh, form or fashion. So. A uh, pair of 15 by 50 Viper HD Vortexes. Um, the Kaibab line is really good. 
Zeiss makes a really good pair of transitional 15 power binos. Um, there's a couple other brands out there too. Mavens um, are kind of, they're not my first choice for that kind of stuff. Um, either are Leupold, honestly Leupold, they have a pair of 15s, I don't like them. They're, they're, they're kind of second rate, they're kind of in the Maven category in my opinion. They, they have a higher price tag, but they don't have the quality and crispness as like a pair of uh, uh, Vortex. The Razors, uh, even the 12s, Razor, they make some cool things. You look at Vortex, they're in that price range where it is expensive, but it's not like three, four thousand dollars $4,000. And so I would do research in that area and maybe try to see what you can get in your price range. That, and that's why I don't like Leupold Maven as much because they are still in that like $1,000 to $1,500 price range, but they don't have the quality or ergonomics and it's not real comfortable they just the, the glass is not quite there in my opinion um, as uh, Vortex or Zeiss now you can go up you know pretty far and go get a pair of uh, Swarovski's 15's and SLC's that are, are gonna cost you two thousand dollars plus you can get um, like I said the BTX which I think you know uh, just factory price is is gonna cost somewhere around four thousand dollars but you don't have to start there so um, I would steer clear of cheap, cheap 15 powers or, or just so you know. So in my opinion, I would much rather have a pair of quality 10 power binos. I would much rather have a pair of Nikon 10s, a Pro Staffs or whatever that are like in that two or $300 prices. Uh, Vortex as well, they make like the Diamondback. I'd much rather have something that I could afford quality. I'd rather have a pair of quality 10s over a pair of crappy 15s. Because when you put those 10s on a tripod, they're still going to be way better, way more efficient than if you were glassing freehand. So you can still hunt Kuzir with 10s. I want to just have that disclaimer. You don't need a pair. I'm giving you suggestions to where what's the best way to start out and be successful. So every price range um, is kind of covered in that. But to be have the, mo the best start and most efficient way to hunt Kuzir, I, I would stick in that quality uh, 15 power binos, a quality tripod and some things to look at there with some tripods and then I would go into, if you're going to go a spotting scope, I would do a Vortex spotting scope. I would either go a Vortex or Razor Line, whatever you can afford. Um, I, I said Vortex, Viper. Viper ra or a Razor Line are really good scopes to start with. I really like the Koa scopes as well, for specifically for spotting scopes. You you should check those out if you're looking at it. The prices are great. The glass is great. Um, and I, I just like the quality. They're Japanese made. Um, to me, they're a really good spotting scope right in line with that uh, that Vortex Razor uh, line. Razor Viper HD stuff. Um, Zeiss makes some pretty good reasonable scopes as well. So check those out. Um, so those are kind of the main main things there. Um, let's touch on a rifle just briefly. Guys, if you're going to go Kuzir hunting, you need to have a rifle that is accurate and you're comfortable shooting at 500 yards. You really need to put some time behind the, your rifle as well. You do not need a crazy $5,000 setup, but you're going to need a rifle that shoots consistently and you are going to need to be consistent shooting a rifle before your Kuzir hunt. So you can have a Ruger American Predator in 6.5 Creedmoor or 300 Win Mag or 7mm Mag or whatever that is, the caliber is not necessarily as important to me hunting Kuzier as is understanding the scope and understanding your dope, which is uh, data on previous engagements, which means you know where your bullet's going to hit when you pull the trigger. You've already done that. You're not just going off the back of a, a factory ammo box, guys. So the biggest thing is having a rifle you're comfortable with shooting 500 yards. The goal is always to shoot a deer at 100 to 200 yards. But the terrain that I described to you earlier in this video does not necessarily allow for guaranteed 200 yard shots. Sometimes the terrain only allows for a 450 yard shot or a 350 yard shot and sometimes even farther in the 700 yard shot where the canyons are just too big. There's no way to climb or glass or even, even have an opening shot where it is anywhere closer than you know, 600 yards across the canyon. So when you have a rifle, you don't need to go out and buy a rifle if, if you have a decent rifle already. In my opinion, if you have a 6.5 Creedmoor, if you have a 243, if you've got a 30 out 6, if you've got a 7 Mag 270, all the rifles that are Magnum calibers, understand them. Take what you have and upgrade it. 
That's the that's the quickest way to get a long range rifle. If you've got a stock Remington 700, you may have bought at Walmart or whatever. First, look into getting a muzzle brake. The Ruger Americans already come pre-threaded. They're really really good to just put a muzzle brake on them. Look at upgrading the trigger. Look at maybe doing some ammo uh, experiments, factory ammo experiments with accuracy. I know ammo is hard to come by, but it's good to, once you get a, uh, some ammo that is accurate, sub MOA or better, that means one inch groups or tighter at 100 yards, that's a good place to start. So that's always got to be your goal. So once you find some ammo that will work, buy a bunch of it. And then work yourself up and get a scope. Now you can get a pretty good reasonable scope at uh, that can be effective at long ranges. One of my favorite scopes is a Vortex Viper line of scopes, whether it's basic HS or LS or HST or PST. I love the Viper scopes because in my experience, I've used them for such a long time. Uh, they have good glass, They have I like their crosshairs, their prices are great, their warranty is awesome, and they always go back to zero. They're a great place to start for long range shooting. And I would start in that 4 to 16. You don't need a 25 power scope. I would start in that 4 to 16 power range. If you want to go 6 to 24 power, I know they offer that. It's That's awesome. You don't have to. So I'm just giving you suggestions. I've used it all. I'm not a huge fan of Leupold stuff. I think, they're, I think their scopes, to me, are a little bit overpriced for the quality of glass and just the features that they offer. I think uh, Vortex is way better in that in that category and again I'm not sponsored by anybody I Vortex doesn't know I'm, I they, they don't care and neither does Leupold they don't care what I'm saying so it's just my opinion of shooting long range for a long time I don't necessarily like Leupold crosshairs I think they're too fat 90% of it that being said I literally just bought a three thousand dollar Leupold Mark V HD scope for my latest long range build so it's not that I hate Leupold, but in that price range we're talking about, I think that medium price range where it's like three to five hundred dollars scopes, I think Vortex blows most most companies out of the water in that range. I think Leupold has some really really good high end scopes that if you want to spend two or three thousand dollars, I think they're um, what is it called? Their whatever HD six HD. Um, stuff is, is good. It's it's good. I, I prefer some of the other stuff, more military style scopes myself, just because of the crosshairs and the adjustments on the scope turrets and stuff like that. So um, all these scopes that I'm talking about guys are, are with exposed turrets or not exposed turrets, but adjustable turrets. You don't need to necessarily have them exposed, but cap turrets are in most cases better, um, but you're going to need to have a scope that can be adjusted uh, on the fly and have uh, MOA or uh, MRAD adjustments for doping your rifle at long ranges. So anyway, just a basic overview. Get a good tripod, get a good pair of binos, get a scope if you can afford it or want it, and then just get your basic rifle setup going. The basic rifle setup, guys, it, it the sky's the limit. Um, but and, and there's no perfect caliber. There's a lot of things that uh, I've seen, but I will tell you that hunting coos deer, if you shoot a coos deer halfway decent, it will go down. Period. Bottom line. The more important thing than a rifle or caliber to me is the bullet. So just make sure you have a good bullet. Um, and a bullet is very different than choosing the right ammo. So when you choose ammo, understand what bullet is at the end of that because that's what hits the animal. So I've had really good experiences with Nosler Acubons. I've had good experiences with Barnes Triple Shock. ELDMs by Hornady, ELDXs by Hornady, uh, they perform pretty good, they shoot pretty good. Um, I like Burger Bullets, which some guys really don't like, uh, but for Kuzier we're talking about a thin-skinned, small-boned animal that weighs 120 pound max. So um, understand how these bullets react and kind of the pros and cons. I would steer away from a super structured bullet um, that doesn't expand at all. A lot of bullets are made to not expand on big game like brown bears and moose and stuff like that. You don't need that kind of bullet. You need, you're need you not as concerned with weight retention of the bullet 
when hunting coos deer as you are with elk or brown bear or, or, or big moose like that. So anyway guys, that's just kind of a brief overview just to get you started, just get you an idea on what it takes to be successful with the basic equipment. You don't have to start way at the top. You don't have to buy Swarovski and Gunworks rifles. Um, you can start with basic equipment and be successful and that's really my main goal of this video guys is for if you're going out coos hunting for the first time, understanding what it takes to get you the best start get you some success uh, glassing and shooting and just put you in the right position before you ever start because what's really frustrating is when you go on a hunt and you think you've done and you think you have the right equipment because it worked in some other state and you show up and you spend all the time and energy and money and realize man if I would have just had a tripod this hunt would have been totally different for me or if I just would have had a pair of 15 power binos man, it would have made this hunt totally worth it. So I just want to give you a good start on this, guys. Please hit me up if you have any questions, comments. Um, I'm going to include some of that stuff in the links below, guys. I don't get any commission. I don't want any commission. I don't get, I'm not sponsored by any brand or company. This is just to help you guys out, just from some of the experience that I have and some of the frustrations and working through problems and finding the right gear. It took a, me buying a lot of gear to get to the point and some of the opinions that I have, guys. So hopefully save you some money in the long run. And uh, I hope you enjoy it and good luck out there coos deer hunting. Hopefully that we all draw tags here coming up in June. Talk to you later.